Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this virtual bridge session. And it's virtual, all right, because we're dealing with virtual reality and the new normal for assessment. Uh, today, we have with us Tanya McDonald from ENET Reality and Lee Priestley from Fife College, um, who are going to take you through some ideas for pepping up and moving on assessment, which uh, um, in some instances has been uh, perhaps living in the dark ages and maybe not moved on. Um, anyway, I'm not going to steal no thunder, and so it's over to Tanya. Thank you so much. So um, as Jason said, I'm Tanya McDonald and I'm head of commercialization for Ecom. Um, so we have Ecom Scotland and Ecom USA, if you have heard of us. Um, and basically we have created a product, Enet Reality. We're actually still creating it. And that's partially why we originally reached out to um, Kenji. So thank you to him as well, because ultimately um, we've been uh, creating this product and throughout this process have worked with quite a few different but I'll kind of give you a little bit of backstory. And I did have a deck, but Lee also has a deck. So I'm not going to bore you with that. I'm just going to make it a little informal and just talk to you. So basically how all of this started is Ecom Scotland started working with Keep Scotland Beautiful, which was originally Scottish Waterways Trust. And all of this was for the Canal College program, where basically these, um, it was a program created for disadvantaged young people. And these individuals were having a difficult time finishing the program. So it was created for these individuals, but they were still having a hard time finishing the program. So it was kind of counteractive. So what ecom did is they ended up working with canal college and creating a virtual reality experience to finish the program um, and ultimately the reasoning that for that was that it was through a field experience that these individuals weren't able to access so whether that be through um, they had a difficult time finding um, babysitters or they had a difficult time actually accessing the field experience and on top of that sometimes field experiences are only offered say you know whether it be Tuesday evenings or on a Saturday and it just didn't work with people's schedules so we created this virtual reality experience and which was really cool and the nice thing about it was we learned a lot um, and through this experience we learned that number one it's very difficult to create virtual reality experiences but we also learned that it's really beneficial for people in either vocational or even educational learning, uh, educational uh, side of it. So what we ended up doing is we created this virtual reality experience. We noticed that there was an increase in the program of individuals actually uh, finishing it and achieving their goals. So that was really good. Um, and then they were able to actually uh, deliver that uh, SBQ qualification, that sort of thing. Um, and so we decided though from that, that this had a bigger um, aspect to it that we could actually help more people experience this, which is where we turned back to UFI and ultimately got funding for a project called Assessing Reality. So the first one was actually just developing the vir virtual reality experience. And this one was actually creating a platform to help other people create uh, virtual reality experiences without as much coding as possible. So basically we partnered with SQA, City of Glasgow College and Fife College. And as Jason kindly mentioned, Lee is here with me um, from Fife College, but I also see Sharon. So she's also here, um, which is wonderful. And we've basically been working on this platform. So the platform ultimately is now called Enet Reality and it enables non-technical users um, to develop their own immersive learning experiences. Um, and on top of that, it's not just creating the virtual reality experiences, it's also including assessments. So we ultimately, a lot of people, when originally doing the research, a lot of people still think of virtual reality as kind of just gamification or it's just a game. And ultimately we wanted to get away from that and make something that was actually really applicable and useful to individuals using it. So what we've done is basically created this platform to be as user friendly as possible. Um, and Lee knows he's been through this the whole process. Is at first it was not as easy to use, but it's definitely been growing um, with us. Um, and all of their feedback has been really wonderful because basically being able to work with the colleges, we had direct feedback of end users who are creating the experiences. And then them being able to think about, well, how do I actually you know, create a virtual reality experience for my students who are normally either in the flesh 
or they are somebody that I see on the on the daily basis. So whether this is you know in the classroom experiences that we're trying to take from that or field experiences and turning it into a virtual reality experience and why would we actually do that? Um, and actually um, COVID and the lockdown has had a huge impact because a lot of organizations say a year ago were saying, I don't really have time um, to even look into this just yet. We're interested, but it's not something that we really think is a priority. Whereas now people are like, well, I don't know how to access people at home. This is a much better way to do that because we wanna be able to give them these field experiences. And so this is an option for them. So um, when we were doing that, ultimately um, figuring out the actual platform itself, we wanted to make sure that the platform was relevant, consistent, and transparent. Because um, if you were to look at virtual reality, um, the relevancy uh, is right there because you can actually take your own images. So let's say, for example, you are going to be showcasing a construction site, which we will be doing a little bit of foreshadowing there. Um, so let's say we're looking at a construction site um, and what are the do's and don'ts in that area. Um, the nice thing about the relevancy of being able to create your own virtual reality experiences, you can go into the actual place you are going to be showcasing and take pictures there um, and actually utilize that as your space inside of your learning. Um, and the second part of that is consistency. So making sure that everyone gets the same experience. So depending on where you are, what teacher you have, et cetera, things can change. But with the consistency side of it, of having this as a basic training and assessment, you actually make sure that everyone's getting the same consistent um, training. And on top of that, that you can update it on a regular basis. So let's say, for example, that construction site has a new um, safety uh, and health section for um, for safe, you know, and you want to make sure that that information is updated. You can actually go ahead and retake those pictures and update it immediately. Um, and then last but not least is the transparency. And we'll kind of talk about this a little bit later. And I do have um, the tool readily available. Um, we want to actually take a look into it, but I wanted to get some of this information out first and then we can kind of break it down. Um, but the transparency side of it is being able to actually how you share that, um, but the reporting that is also available. So basically we're still obviously developing this, but it depends on where individuals want information. So for example, when we first created one for the fourth rail bridge, um, that was basically working at heights and we had it basically uh, notify or report where the individuals were looking and why. And so that is something that ultimately is going to go into VNet reality itself as well, because understanding where these individuals are looking and focusing, because there's a part in uh, the fourth rail bridge, basically, if you work on the fourth rail bridge and a train is passing you, you are not supposed to look at the train. That is counterintuitive to me. I don't know about any of you, um, but if you were to try and look at the train, it would actually showcase a warning sign. Um, and it would actually notify you. So the cool thing about that is the transparency side is you get the report, it shows you as an individual, you looked at the train, this is when you looked at it and you can kind of reflect, but then it also showcases the uh, manager or the teacher, um, educator, what that individual did and what time. So it gives that opportunity for additional conversation, kind of putting that individual, um, that uh, manager in that um, learner's uh, shoes. So kind of a different experience. Um, but so just kind of a couple of little examples there. I'm going to let Lee take over because he's going to kind of show you a little bit more about the actual tool um, and how he got involved and what that's looked like. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'd like to kind of jump in and, and show you what's been made so far and kind of where the, the current state of the tool is. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about how, how I got involved and where we can see this going in, in future. Two seconds and I'll share my screen. So as Tanya mentioned, it's a, it's a virtual reality assessment tool that's really focused on 360 images and being able to place uh, interactive or static media elements within that 3D scene. Okay, so it's a kind of fixed perspective, um, fixed perspective uh, VR experience. 
Um, so we've, we've started the assessment just with like a general introduction um, and we can kind of click on different assets to, to jump between uh, different parts of the assessment. Uh, the original assessment for this chosen unit uh, is based on multiple choice questions. So I think there's 12 multiple choice questions and we felt that this, um, it was oversimplified and it wasn't really relevant to the situations that the students will be in in, in employment. Um, so we felt like this unit was really good for, for a VR kind of uh, assessment as well. Um, there was a few questions that did involve uh, involved elements that probably wouldn't have suited VR. Uh, so we've stuck with a few multiple choice questions and that is a, an asset that we can use in the in VR experience. So we've got a couple of multiple choice questions. We can still look around and observe the scene. Um, we can have interaction with any, any elements of the image. But the most interesting part is the, the visual identification of parts of the image. So for example, part of this assessment would be to observe the scene around you and select any unsafe tools and debris. Um, so we can have a, have a quick look around the scene and we can try and identify anything that would be uh, thought of as unsafe. So that could be things that are sitting on the floor. Maybe that's uh, this wood that's sitting on the, on the roof. And we can also tell uh, if things are incorrect, we can, we can say that no, that is actually a safe option. Um, so similar format for the rest of the assessment and that we wanted to really focus on the, you know, the VR aspect of it, being able to visually look around the scene and identify certain aspects of the, uh, of the environment. So similar kind of thing, uh, unsafe placement of ladders. We've got uh, two ladders within the scene and we can uh, click on the correct and incorrect answers. And obviously this, uh, as Tanya said, could be exported uh, externally to show that this student has clicked on this uh, element, but they haven't clicked on the other one. And that's how we kind of uh, come up with our, our results at the end. Um, so the, the form of the assessment is very similar to, to this. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, talk about how it a little bit. If I'm going on too long, please just tell me. <laughs> um, yeah, so like I like mentioned, it's uh, 360 images, fixed position. Um, you can take these using a 360 image uh, camera or you can use a normal camera and use Im image stitching software, which essentially just puts them all together. Uh, we can have interactive or static media elements in the scene. Uh, and we can we can basically give it instructions to link to other scenes uh, or to, to you know, show another asset or, or do something based on a click. Uh, like I mentioned, the, the key focuses for this kind of draft assessment were the, the integration of the multiple choice questions that were the current uh, assessment methods, while also looking at the visual identification questions because that's really where the, the VR stuff shines. So it's to get into more uh, immersive experience, um, obviously less risk than going onto an actual building site. Um, and just to clarify for, for this kind of draft assessment, this background image uh, was just a test. So if we were doing this for a, for a proper assessment, we would go and find a building site with actual hazards and risks and we'd take those. Take those. Um, so why, why Fife College got involved? Um, so we thought it was a, a very interesting uh, and innovative tool and, and approach for assessment. So that's, that was the main reason why we got involved. Um, but also collaborating with commercial partners seems like a, a great idea and, and kind of ending up with a useful tool. Uh, we've been involved since the since or early stages of the project, at least. I won't say the very beginning. Um, so we were involved in discussions with the other education partners, as well as SQA and Ecom. Uh, we kind of looked at the impact it could have in further and higher education. We helped develop the tool with the kind of functionality that we needed. Um, and then we actually created an assessment, have sent it to, to users to test. Uh, and we'll, we'll look at uh, verifying the assessment with SQA and with uh, faculty staff. Uh, and then integrate it into a SCORM package. That's, that's not really where, where my knowledge lies, but uh, I know that is something we're going to try and do. Uh, so as Tanya had mentioned, we'd really try to pick a, pick a unit that would have a use for VR assessment. Um, so the kind of general themes that we'd, we'd thought about were kind of health and safety risks, uh, psychological training, things like the, the top of the bridge training that Tanya had mentioned. Um, it's, it's difficult to prepare people for that 
without sending them up there. Uh, so it, it's probably more cost effective to have them practice first, see how they feel, and then take them up afterwards. Um, or inaccessible or expensive training, you know, things like helicopter pilots, you know, you, you have to go through a lot, of, a lot of training just to get there to begin with. So this could be a, a good choice. So we chose health and safety and construction, um, a level four unit. We felt that this was a, a good base level to get the, the functionality down. Um, it would work well with kind of visual identification of risks or hazards. Um, we had access to a, a, a roofing environment that we could take a 360 image. Um, and we have staff that currently deliver the unit, so we could always say double check with them to make sure it did meet the standards that were required. So that's why we chose health and safety and construction. Uh, SQA were involved in the project from uh, as early as we were at the Fife College. Uh, so we had a discussion as to the unit that we wanted to choose, um, what were the current assessment methods, and how would VR assessment methods improve anything at all, uh, or would it? Um, and also talked a little bit about accessibility concerns, uh, but those were, those were mostly met. And then after we had actually made the assessment, um, or, or in the future, uh, we'll be involved in SQA in the internal verification process, the external verification process, and the kind of quality assurance to make sure that it does meet the required specification, and it's up to the proper standards, and things like that. Uh, what impact has it had, and, and what impact could it have in the future? Uh, I think in the past, like we've mentioned, some of some of these faculty areas maybe struggle to find accessible training environments, uh, whether that's difficult to access or expensive. Um, and obviously, they would have to go into high risk situations to to learn about these things. And so, with this tool, you know, I think we've got a more immersive uh, learning environment. It's lower risk, and you know, it, it functions the way we need it to function, and it has the assessment ability built in. Um, and in future, I would say that uh, we'll obviously still, or, or Ecom will obviously still look to include more accessibility features um, and more tool features, uh, as well as just creating more assessments. I think the more assessments that are made, the better the tool will be. So yeah, hopefully that, that helped. Uh, let me know if I can do anything else. But I'd say, Tanya, back to you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so basically, um, really have appreciated the impact and help that Fife, City of Glasgow College and SQA have given us. And at this stage, basically, we have just launched um, the product um, in, uh, we were at the uh, VRAR Global Conference. Um, and, but at this point, we're actually opening it up to a larger beta, which is why I originally reached out to Kenji, um, because right now on the website, we offer a two week um, free trial to test it out and give us feedback. But internally, we are doing actually a larger beta. So if somebody feels like they could actually utilize this in an impactful way, we'd be able to give them extra time um, to be able to use the tool. But on top of that, being able to internally um, kind of get that feedback and see, make sure that it actually uh, works with everybody's systems and everything because, um, like Lee said, we've worked really hard on it so far, but getting getting even more feedback and that sort of thing. But I looked at the time and it looks like 11.21, so I want to make sure I give us enough time to kind of discuss. And I do have the deck and the tool itself if you want to see, so happy to answer questions, but I'll uh, pass it over to Jason. Thank you very much, Tanya, and thank you very much, Lee. Um, whilst you're thinking of questions to ask, I'll jump in with a couple. That's a host prerogative, really. Um, uh, Lee, I think I'll start with you. Um, what sort of investment of time is required in order to create the sort of thing that you've, you've put there? How much of a burden is this to, to create? Sure, that's, that's one of the most important questions. Um, I would say it's, uh, it's not too difficult in that the, the current user experience is fairly familiar. Um, to be honest, it's, it's got a similar uh, kind of idea behind it as, as almost 360 PowerPoint type um, concept. So we can we can have uh, you know hyperlinks jumping from slide to slide. Um, so I, I wouldn't have said it's too complicated, um, but I do have to admit that I have a digital based background. You know, I teach 3D animation, so I, I use digital tools all the time. Um, so I can I can see how it may be uh, a little bit of a, a kind of upskill for for some staff, but I would I would say it's 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 fairly user friendly. 
Yeah. yeah, I think we all know members of staff who would need some hand holding in order to be able to stitch together images, for example, not quite at that stage, but uh, uh, the support's <laughs> there. Um, could I encourage anyone to come off their uh, mute and ask a question, or if you're shy, you can always um, put your question into the chat box, though we do like to hear from you. Hi there. James. Uh, our question, it's a bit of a, a general question um, for both Lee and Tanya. I'm just interested where you both see the future of VR and education. Say 10 years from now, where do you think it will be? Um, I mean, based on, so even before I really got involved in this project, uh, I started doing some research on that and it is growing rapidly. Um, and then even the uh, event that I was in Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, the VR AR Global Summit was amazing. And it looks like, because we actually did a poll, which was quite interesting. Um, and it, I, we asked like, when you think of VR, what do you think of? I thought a lot of people in that realm were gonna say gaming, but actually most people said education. Um, and I think that people are really starting to see this because as, um, like I mentioned earlier with the lockdown, a lot of individuals or are, uh, are organizations are looking at this as an opportunity to be able to help share experiences when you can't access your, uh, I always think of crew, um, but your, uh, either your employees or your students. Um, because it is a way to give them experiences that either are hard to access, et cetera, or in a time like now, you can't uh, meet in person. So I definitely think that it's something that is going to continue to grow. It looks like HP just launched another headset um, actually at this last event. Um, and I know that a lot of other individuals, like for example, our tool, um, itself, we wanted to make it as uh, flexible as possible, something I didn't mention earlier, is you can use it either with a headset, with a mobile device, a tablet, or a desktop, so you don't have to have a headset to actually deliver it, because I think that that's something that was holding a lot of educational areas out, um, and this is some of the feedback that we got from the colleges, was can you make it accessible on a desktop? Because if you think about it, I mean, the health safety hazard of trying to hand off a headset from one person to the next, um, that's not really something you can do right now. So being able to create these and you can use a headset, but also being able for the flexibility, that's partially why we wanted to keep the cost so low or as low as possible. So yeah, that's my Lee, if you have anything. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you, Tanya. Um, I, would, I would say that uh, VR in, in 10 years for education wise, I, I would like to see kind of full freedom of movement and, and full integration of all the, the VR uh, Kind of uh, tools that we have just now, you know, even things like haptics, haptic feedback. Um, you know, there's lots of different things that could be in, included, but I think we we definitely need to start small, and that, that there's no way to create these systems easily. You know, you you have to be a game developer to make a VR game, basically. Um, so I think this is a great stepping point between the the nothing that we currently have and what we're aiming to be in full freedom of movement in, in 360 VR. Thank you very much. Anyone else like to come in with a question? Or else you're going to end up with my questions. Oh, Kenji, come on in. Um, sorry, so I, I've i just joined the meeting, but um, I remember seeing a demonstration of this platform earlier on. And, and one of the things that struck me is the ease of the authoring process. It, it did seem more intuitive than other platforms uh, that I've used. So if we've already covered it, if we've already seen the authoring bit, I totally missed out and we'll catch up on the recording. But I just, just wanted to say it looked good to me at the time. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and hi, Kenji. Um, yeah, I actually, because I have either a slide deck or even if we do have extra time, I know that it was technically 30 minutes. So I was trying to get as much information as I, out as I could, but, but I'd be happy to walk through the tool and be able to show you. Basically, if you've ever used something like um, Squarespace, where you kind of, it's, you don't have to actually create the website itself. You just kind of, it's like a drag and drop or select options. We basically tried to create the same thing, kind of like a, a PowerPoint for virtual reality, because ultimately the authoring space is a blank canvas. 
you upload your imagery um, and videos. And actually, this is something we just integrated was we just uh, put some global media up there that's free to use. Um, so it's free backgrounds and some um, icons and that sort of thing um, for people to use and play with before you even get started. So you just upload your imagery and then you kind of storyboard so like you would with the powerpoint is where do i want these individuals to start you probably create an introduction um, and you do that by either adding um, text video um, audio um, all kinds of different options um, i know we only have a, a few minutes left but oh if, yeah, if, if you can show some of that oh, sure. as part of the recording that yeah. if, if everyone else is okay with that that's... yeah um, let's do this. Well, Tanya sets that up. A quick question for Lee. Have you had any student feedback on it so far? Oh, you're on mute. So, sorry. <laughs> uh, we sent out the, the user testing, or we sent out the assessment for user testing uh, within the last uh, week or so. So, we're still waiting to get official feedback um, from our larger test audience. Um, but the small bit of feedback that we have had from colleagues and other staff um, is generally positive. You know, it, it's definitely in the right direction. There's there's still some usability tweaks that we need to make sure that, uh, you know, things like you don't accidentally click on one thing or another. Um, but the, the overall functionality of the, the VR assessment that worked well and that was received very positively. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much. And over to Tanya for a demonstration of the authoring. Yeah. Are you able to see my screen with the authoring tool? I am Haymarket Station, if I'm not. Uh... Yeah, that is actually. <laughs> so um, basically here you can see um, I had basically uploaded an image. So um, you can just either double click and add your information. So um, one thing that people ask is, do you create 3D models in this? No, but you can upload 3D models into it. Um, so let's say, for example, we wanted to insert a single question. So this is question one. Um, single question media. Um, so you can see here that that's just added. So um, and we can basically add quite a few different things. So um, if you wanted to do like a quiz, which we're actually updating, and as you want to change things, um, you have your information down here. So if you wanted to change anything about this, then you can add actions. So if you were to complete this, um, for example, it might actually tie to learning outcomes, which we didn't really talk about. That's the part of the um, assessment side that we really wanted to make sure was robust. And Lee was really helpful in helping us create that because from an educational standpoint, you have these learning outcomes. So maybe it's a, a basic class, but there are things that you need to learn from that class. How do you keep track of that? And that is something that we integrated, um, which was uh, making sure that you can add outcomes. And as you complete that, it keeps track of that inside of the tool. So yeah, that's um, these are basically. Uh, let's go ahead and leave. Uh, that's kind of that's the authoring space, but this is um, the dashboard of the tool. Um, you've got your project, so multiple different ones. This is my tutorial one that I show because internally we have like way too many going on. Um, we've got outcomes. Um, this is the media I was just talking about. So all of the different uh, media items that we offer that are um, global media you can use if you were to sign up for it. Um, daily reports. So when you do actually have somebody take an assessment, you can request a uh, report from that because they take that assessment, it reports back to the tool. Um, and that then you can look at that report to see, okay, well, what exactly did they do? So it'll show you when they started, how long it took them, when they actually accomplished each outcome, um, the learning outcomes we were just talking about, and when they finished. But obviously that's something that we are even building out even more. So um, for example, where they're looking, the XAPI reports, that sort of thing. Um, your learners, so basically being able to send it out to people, we was uh, foundational in helping us figure all of that out. 
um, users. So these are the people who are authoring the tool. Um, so you can see here, either you're an admin, which means that you have access to everything, or you are only an author, and that means that you actually just create. So um, an admin has access to things such as, um, so my account, everyone would have access to. But, Thank you very much, Tanya, for that insight into the authoring tool. That's brought us up to the half an hour at the moment. So. Uh, Yes, um, it's a new age of creativity, I think, open to us in, uh, in this assessment. And uh, it's nice to see something that moves on from text to the visual and indeed uh, something just much more real indeed, whether it's virtual reality or not. So um, I'll have to dust off my virtual reality goggles. And with that, I'll bring the recording to a close. Thank you very much, Tanya and Lee.